So we're just going to wait a few moments so people can start joining. And then we'll do the introductions. Hello, I can see people have started joining now. Hello, everybody. Hello to everybody watching. Um, are we supposed to be seeing Anna Marie's screen? I feel like it's on the wrong screen. Oh, okay, apparently my screen is showing. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with the introductions now, since that's gonna take a little bit of a while anyway. Um, hello to everybody who's watching live and to the people who uh, will be watching this back later. Um, welcome to Africa Fashion Week London's Zoom series. So if you have been following AFWL for the past few weeks uh, to a few months, you would have seen all sorts of interesting things um, that have been going on, panel talks, seminars, online sessions, discussions, just, just all sorts of things. Um, revolving around the topics of, you know, fashion, the creative industry, the entertainment industry. So today the series is continuing with somebody who is uh, very, very uh, impactful, very, very successful, very, very insightful. Um, and I'm actually really looking forward to um, being able to watch the masterclass in addition to hosting it. Um, I had a, we had a brief chat yesterday over uh, Instagram, uh, Instagram Live. Um, where she introduced the topic a little bit. And I think it's going to be a really, really, really special talk. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to Jade Fletcher. Hi. <laughs> so, <laughs> hello, Jade. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. So I'm just going to uh, tell everybody a little bit about you. Um, so Jade will be speaking today on the topic of planning and managing fashion events. Who is Jade Fletcher, you ask? Jade is the CEO and the founder of Bespoke Consultancy. Uh, did I get that correct? Founder of Bespoke Consultancy <laughs> Management and Production Company, Jade Green Events. Okay, uh, since 2012. Uh, Jade Fletcher has worked in the entertainment industry for over 15 years, uh, starting as a professional dancer and a model booker before moving into events after unfortunately suffering from an injury. However, having produced her first fashion show in 2009, she went on to work on a series of shows and events with a particular focus on strategic planning for the creative music, fashion, and entertainment sectors. Working both freelance and with her team, she's pitched and implemented creative concepts as well as, a project, uh, as, well as project managed events and shows resulting in repeat bookings, established and trustworthy reputation, and regular referrals, which we love to hear. Um, some of her highlights include the UKG Live concerts, so for example at Indigo 2, Electric Ballroom and the Steel Yard, um, the Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth Fashion Council launch uh, at New Zealand House, the Red Bull Culture Clash at O2, the MOBO nominations launch and awards at the Grand Connaught Rooms and SSE Arena in Glasgow, um, even the London Olympic Games, which was based at the Mandarin uh, Oriental. She's worked across Europe, she's worked in Prague, Barcelona, Brussels, Rome, and basically everywhere in between. Um, she's passionate about delivering a dedicated bespoke service and working individually as, uh, as a part of a team, sorry, as well as, under, uh, as a part of a team to ensure client and customer care is of the highest standard. Jane won the RBS Inspiring Women Enterprise Award in 2013, and Jade Green Events has gone on to win Lux International Magazine's Best London Events Company in 2017. Welcome, everybody. Once again, Jade Fletcher, I'm going to hand over to you now for your masterclass. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, yeah, that feels like quite a lot. Sometimes you don't realize the things you've done over the years <laughs> until someone says it like that. Um, I am going to share my screen, hopefully, um, and talk you through kind of how I manage events. So, um, that was a great introduction. <laughs> I did a very, uh, well, a much shorter introduction. So when I was looking back, it's actually 19 years in the entertainment industry. I am 37. 
um, although I still feel about 25, which I put down to working in the entertainment industry, definitely keeps you young. Um, 11 years in events. Um, and as um, NEFA mentioned, uh, first fashion show production was in 2009. So from there, it was just such an exciting experience. And, you know, you, you put something together for a number of months. And then when you can sit back and, and really watch something come alive and people's reaction and the impact of it um, that's just the most rewarding thing so from there I decided to continue freelancing specifically in events and for the creative industries and started Jade Green Events in 2012 so yeah worked on the Olympics which was amazing um, in 2013 World Bank of Scotland Women in Enterprise Award um, and the rest you know about so yeah for the first two years um, I worked with Africa Fashion Week London <laughs> um, watched them literally go from strength to strength which has been amazing um, very very successful brand and hoping to work with them again <laughs> this year so um, great to be doing this masterclass with you guys so um, some of the clients that I've worked with, this was from the MOBO Awards, so Jesse J, Jason Derulo, Sugar Babes. Um, and really want to start with um, just an introduction to the planning process. So obviously I do all different types of events in the creative sectors, but obviously today we're going to be talking more about fashion. So there are kind of principles that relate to every event and every type of event and every sector of event but then there's kind of smaller details that are going to be specific to fashion events. So I just wanted to put some stats forward. So this is from 2019. I'm not going to kind of go into the details of the stats. You can have a look and the, the presentation will be available for people to look at after the class. Um, but basically, I didn't want to put 2020 in because <laughs> obviously for, for obvious reasons, it's a bit of a write-off. But the fashion sector is a huge sector, um, grosses millions, trillions of dollars globally. Um, and despite what's happening with the economy and the pandemic, fashion is still growing from strength to strength in specific ways. So at the moment, um, there's a huge uh, demand in fast fashion. So, you know, boohoo.com, pretty little thing, nastygirl.com are still doing really well. Um, the e-commerce side obviously is doing really well because no one's going out and about. Um, sectors that haven't really upped their game so you know um, kind of M&S you know are, are suffering obviously um, and some other companies but fashion is still going and what I think we're going to see more of a rise of in the future as well is sustainable fashion because that's really happening with um, travel and how we perceive travel in the environment um, so I think that's a plus um, so yeah so event sectors within fashion, obviously there's lots of different um, types of events that we can have. Um, charity, so I've just mentioned a few here that I've done. So charity fashion events, one of the first events that I did was for Hammerson who partnered with Westfield over the last few years. And some of their clients include the Arcadia Group um, who own um, Topshop and all those, those um, retail brands. So and they did this big charity creative fashion production which raised money for a charity called Fairbridge which is now part of Prince's Trust so that was um, that was a great experience and that was completely different from kind of high fashion and typical fashion that I've done previously obviously you've got runway and within that you've got different types of runway you've got PR collection launches label launches collaboration launches trunk shows you've got fashion week and weekends you've got award ceremonies and then obviously you've got more of the social side so you've got um, weddings um, birthdays private events engagements anything like that and then more of the entertainment side where there's um, a crossover so obviously clubbing and nightlife music so a lot of the music artists that i've worked with um, do a lot of crossover with fashion and some of them have their own fashion brands as well um, obviously the celebrity collaboration so you see little mix at the moment partnering rita or has done partnerships um, and entertainment in general so i'm sure there's other things that you can think of as well pre-event planning so basically um, how i do it i section everything into four so i have pre-event planning, event coordination um, and logistics, um, then on-site delivery and then post-event analysis. And within that, I have lots and lots of folders, <laughs> spreadsheets, uh, Word documents, Google spreadsheets and that kind of thing 
um, which, you know, obviously it takes a bit longer to go through. But essentially, four areas for, the, for um, a complete project cycle. And really, if you'd have asked me a few years ago what I do, I would have said event management and production. But now I would say it's just project management in the event sector. Um, and once you can kind of get a grasp on project management, you can apply that to pretty much any sector and industry. So pre-event planning is really important. It's really addressing goals and objectives. Um, and what I've found, I freelance for quite a few um, event agencies previously. Generally what I see happening, and even internally with some companies as well, is they're given a brief, they're given a budget, and they're told when the event's happening, and that's it. And they basically have to run with it and that's fine <laughs> a lot of people do a good job doing things like that but it's then really difficult to measure the impact um, was the event truly successful or was it just a, a good evening out or a good day out um, was it worth generating um, you know the level of income the budget behind it um, does it have long impact long-term impact for the brand are customers going away happy um, there's lots of things to consider. So, you know, the first thing that I like to do is actually have a meeting with the client, which will generally take anywhere between one to two hours, <laughs> depending on how the conversation goes. But it's really about thinking, why are you doing the event and what do you want to get out of it? So I've put in here KPIs as well. Um, I don't know if everyone knows what KPI means, but it's basically key performance indicators. And that gives us a baseline to measure the long-term impact and success of an event. So agendas and outcomes, this is obviously quite a big part of it. So what we want to do is get to the bottom of why are we <laughs> as the client potentially, or why is our client hosting the event in the first place? Are they celebrating something? So for example, isn't it an award show where they are celebrating um, you know, the, the top designer, emerging designers, things like that. And they often come after um, a big you know, fashion three-day event or something like that. Sometimes they're standalone. Um, could it be that they are launching a collection or they want to raise awareness of a new collection or a collaboration? Maybe it's a service because obviously fashion doesn't just entail clothing. There's makeup, there's styling, there's hair, there's accessories, so many other um, industries within fashion itself. Um, is it to raise awareness for a particular cause? So, um, you know, uh, or even, you know, with Africa Fashion Week London and, and other specific fashion, fashion weeks um, and events, is it to kind of highlight a particular type of fashion? At the moment, the Commonwealth Fashion Council is doing a lot um, globally about blue fashion which is taking um, products from the ocean <laughs> um, and turning it into sustainable clothing. So things like seaweed. Um, and that's amazing. The amount of things that you can do in terms of accessories and clothing um, with natural products is, is amazing. So, you know, sometimes the events are just about kind of creating that level of awareness. Sometimes it's feeding into um, a pipeline. So it's a lot more strategic. Um, and sometimes it's just to create revenue on the day. Um, so sales pipeline would be more like it's part of a long-term strategy. Um, London Fashion Week, for example, buyers are coming, um, they're seeing the new collections, then, you know, meetings will be set up, phone calls will be had, um, you know, collections shown, that type of thing. Or, you know, with some of the smaller fashion weeks, it's a chance for um, designers to even collect um, uh, revenue on the day, um, which is great. Um, and sometimes it's just to share information. So, you know, you have designer Q&As and um, specific exhibitions and that kind of thing. So really to kind of look at impact, what we want to do, as I said, as I said um, get to the bottom of why the event's happening in the first place. And that gives us some measurables. So this is really the starting point to put together an event brief and measure the outcomes. So some of the questions that I ask, um, who is the event for? <laughs> so we can look at it in two ways. We can think about B2B. So the event might be for a particular client or it might be for us internally or for our own event, or it might be um, B2C. Usually it's a combination of the two. So um, some of the shows I've worked on, for example, it's B2B because they're involving designers who want to showcase their collections. It's B2C because customers want to, to see the collections and the customers might be a mixture of um, buyers, press um, and media, 
Um, and it might be people who just actually want to buy something unique, depending on the type of event that it is. We also need to think about what type of fashion event is it going to be and what's the format going to be. So, okay, it's um, a fashion show, but is it going to be a digital fashion show? Is it going to be literally just a fashion show or is there going to be networking drinks afterwards? Um, is it going to be a trunk show? Um, is it going to be in store? Um, then we're thinking about when. So this is something that's quite interesting because I've worked with people who've had amazing events, but they haven't had the turnout that they expected because they weren't looking at the right time <laughs> um, for their demographic. So, you know, for example, during London Fashion Week, everyone's going to flock. That's, that's a given. But, you know, there's certain days that are more popular than others. And that's why certain designers showcase on specific days. So when you're having it, um, and the time of day you're having it is a real consideration as well and something that you need to talk to your client about if you're doing it on behalf of a client. Where? That's also a factor. Geographically, where? Um, is it easy for people to get to? What are transport links like? Um, and as I said, why? So essentially, why are you hosting it um, and what do you expect to get out of it? So then I'm looking at the client brief. So all of that information, just to give me a basic overview of the event, start kind of triggering ideas, um, thinking about logistics, thinking about creativity. Um, then we kind of want to consolidate it and look at the client's brief. And what I do um, with that initial consultation I have um, with the client, I then make that into a brief, which might change up to three times throughout the process of the project. So the first point, whose choice is it anyway? So here I'm really referring to things like specific suppliers. So venue, for example. So sometimes people come to me and they'll ask me, ask me for particular recommendations for a venue, which I can help with. You know, we have lots of links with venues and different suppliers. But often the, um, the client will come with a venue already in mind. A lot of things will be in mind. Um, um, or signed off already so you know there's some considerations that we might go through that actually maybe we need to talk about with the client but we don't actually need to do that much with so you know maybe the contract has, si has been signed um, the marketing has been done but we still need to kind of tick through and make sure that everyone's on the same same page and everyone knows what's happening we also need to think about the client versus customers and musts versus wants. <laughs> so the client might be um, your separate client. It might be um, a particular designer. Um, and then the customer, for example, might just be the attendees coming. So generally, the client will have a specific agenda or outcome in mind. So the client maybe wants to um, sell 50 tickets and create a revenue stream of 20% for example um, the customer <laughs> wants to get out of it um, a unique experience maybe a particular um, one-off piece for a special occasion um, so that's their expectation so you need to look at both expectations and make sure that you're meeting them um, and ideally exceeding them and then you're looking at must versus wants so if you're doing a fashion show production a runway show there's going to be certain things that the venue must be able to facilitate. So there must be areas for people to change, <laughs> um, or at least the, the capacity to have um, uh, divisions put in, for example. Um, there must be certain um, things in house, or if not, then you need to think about them like seating. Um, and then there might be things that they want. So for example, you know, maybe um, the client would like a particular type of entertainment, but maybe that's not actually going to suit the customers so all of these things need to be looked at and this is what I say when people um, gather information a lot of the time they'll just say what would you like <laughs> um, what's your budget yes we can make it happen but they're not really um, creating as much of an impact as they could do if they were really sitting and looking and thinking about what's going to make it an, an exceptional and really impactful event um, so once might be, as I said, you know, a particular type of entertainment, it might be a particular type of food, but maybe that's not feasible at this venue. And what we need to think about is what are the must haves, first of all, and then what are the nice to haves? Um, the importance of uniqueness or not. So basically some um, events, it's really important that they have something really stand out 
So I've worked with some fashion um, clients that, you know, they, they want a full set design. They want lighting, they want theming, they want waterfalls or whatever in the foyer. Um, and there's some other clients who just want a straight runway show because it's not about the theatricals. It's not about um, the creativity. It's literally about selling the clothes. So again, these are discussions that need to be had quite early on so that you can all manage your expectations. Um, obviously you, you have people like, had people like Alexander McQueen who put on these huge shows and that's something that I was a fan of personally coming from a performing background um, but not everyone um, needs that wants it or appreciates it uh, one designer that I worked with um, part of a, a show kind of had a bit of a, a strop <laughs> uh, because the event organizers wanted something really theatrical and he just did not want anything like that he didn't want any props he didn't want any um, choreography or anything because everything had to be centered around the clothing so you know managing these expectations from the start is really important um and something just to think about at the moment so obviously um events are not happening live we don't know when they're going to come back large-scale shows doesn't look likely for the rest of this year and who knows what it's going to look like after the whole kind of social distancing um, but events as a whole still need to carry on you know, because businesses need to carry on. Um, branding needs to be out there, um, awareness, visibility. So, um, you know, a lot of people are going to um, virtual events at the moment, and there's lots of different ways to do it. Obviously, Africa Fashion Week are up there doing these live masterclasses. Um, you know, you could do live Q and A's with designers, as I said, um, bespoke invite only, tours of specific collections you know there's lots of opportunity out there um, using things like zoom facebook live instagram live and then you've got um, a real um, interesting suite of platforms that are coming out now specifically for events and entertainment um, and I'm not sure if fashion has really jumped on it yet but i think there's lots of scope too so then so that's basically the pre-planning getting all the information together then we start the planning <laughs> Um, so lots of considerations. These are just a few. So for example, the time, um, is the time that your client wants to do it actually going to suit the type of people who want to attend? You know, you really have to think about these things, um, and duration. So something that would have been a four day live event is maybe now a two day event. If you're taking it virtual, um, do you have enough content for, um, a live event or do you have too much content? Uh, do you have enough <laughs> all of these are considerations um, we're thinking about dates you know um, is there a particular date that you should avoid is there a particular date that ties in really well um, time zones again you know if you're thinking about live events you're thinking about what times um, even things like for example i've had clients that want to start their events at say 6 p.m and maybe it finishes at 11 p.m and that's fine but they don't want to provide food. So what's going to happen? <laughs> People are going to either not want to go or they're going to pop out halfway through or they're going to stay at the event and maybe complain. So all of this kind of needs to be factored into the planning process as well. Um, and if you're doing things virtually, then we need to think about time zones. So there's been lots of virtual events that I've wanted to attend. Um, and actually it's just not really feasible for me to um, attend the live versions of it. You know, some of the events are coming from America and they're, obviously their time zones are completely different. I don't want to start watching an event at, you know, seven o'clock on, on a Wednesday evening, you know, that's when I'm winding down. So um, again, things we need to think about, maybe, you know, the UK isn't their specific target market, so it doesn't really matter and we can watch things on demand, but these are all factors and considerations. We also want to think about capacities. So, you know, if we're doing it live, we want to think, okay, you know, in order for us to reach our KPIs <laughs> or our goals, our financial goals, we need to have 300 people attend the event. But maybe once you put in a catwalk um, and backstage, um, you can only fit 200. How's that in going to impact your bottom line? Um, and are there other ways that you can make it up, for example? facilities and features available and sorry just going back to capacities same thing for um online events as well you know zoom has a, a certain capacity if you want to go beyond that or uh, beyond a certain time again that's going to affect your budget 
facilities um, within a venue. So, yeah, um, some uh, venues will have it all. Some won't have enough, but maybe the team behind it is so great and have so many great ideas and are really kind of happy to help that you think, oh, let's go with it anyway, because that actually happens with one of the events that I did when I first started. Um, and again, when you're looking at virtual events, same thing, features available. So, you know, maybe you, you're happy to have everyone um, in one room. You know, if someone's leading a masterclass, that's fine. But if you're doing a QA and a with different designers, which, you, you know, you could do and you want to show different collections, maybe you need the facilities or the features to showcase different designers in different rooms. So regardless of whether that's on site at a live venue or whether that's virtual, you know, you, you need to think about how you see the day flowing. And as I keep coming back to, um, a lot of it is down to budget. So, you know, you might have your ideal scenario, but it costs this. You can't justify that cost right now. So actually it's going to mean this. Um, and you as the event planner um, or event organizer, you need to think how much is that going to impact? Is it worth putting the budget up to get what you need? Can you even do that? Or what compromises can you make or other solutions? And that's the great thing about people who work in events. We're all solution driven. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of people who might do um, events in-house. Maybe it's not their main job. Um, but the, the thing about employing someone within events is, like I said, they are creative. They have a network of individuals that are able to be creative as well. Um, and so actually, although a lot of people can do events to carry it off in a really successful way, you know, it, it's a great investment if this is something that you want to do long term. So suppliers as well, when you think about suppliers, maybe the client has their own um, particular suppliers that they want to use. Fine. Sometimes that's really helpful. But again, sometimes it doesn't really match the brand. So um, one client I had, they wanted to have a particular type of food at an awards event. And um, the food would have been great <laughs> taste wise, but it wasn't practical, you know, because they didn't have seating in the networking area. Everyone was standing. So we need to think about what furniture is going to be there. Poser tables. So um, what are we going to put the food on? How are we going to eat the food? How is it going to be presented? And actually we worked out that that particular caterer wasn't going to be um, a benefit to that particular event and we completely scrapped it and, and got someone new in. So again, it's, it's kind of having these really honest conversations and not just thinking about what the client wants, but thinking about what's feasible for the guests attending as well. We're thinking about incentives as well. So I've put down here B2B and B2C. So um, B2B, so that might be you want particular designers to attend, you want them to um, book a stand, for example. So um, incentives that you might want to consider is, you know, early bird discounts at a particular time. Uh, um, book your stand um, by this time, you'll get 50% off or whatever it is. B2C as well. So it's important to think about the customers because there are so many events happening and have been for years. It's such a competitive industry. So what's going to make people want to come to your event as opposed to anything else? Um, maybe it's to see um, a particular model, a particular designer, to have a meet and greet, to win a competition, any of those things. And again, you know, these are all conversations worth having. Um, and that all ties into marketing and promotion. So designing the experience, <laughs> content and theming. Um, the tools that I tend to use, these are examples, obviously not from fashion events, but I start with a mood board um, and go on to floor plans and mock-ups. So the mood board, the client may uh, come with a mood board already. Great, I'll send it around to the team. Um, or maybe they'll just have some ideas and I'll put the mood board together. Uh, and kind of go back and forwards until we'll, um, we've got what they want. Um, or maybe they'll just ask for ideas and this is where the creativity really comes from and that, that's a lot of fun. Um, so the mood board really kind of sets the scene for um, the whole look and feel of the event. Um, and you're looking at two things here. I've got event and production because it's two different things. You know, what time your event starts uh, can be very different from what time the production starts. And when I say production, I mean, you know, if you're doing a runaway show, for example. So how, you know, it might be that you want the venue as a whole and the event as a whole to, to be really white, clean, um, professional, and then the show is going to be really colorful. Um, there could be so many different things. Um, and 
again, it's, it's managing expectations, it's communication, it's, you know, when you've got a clear idea of what everything's supposed to look and feel like um, that you can share around with the team, then you can start putting everything together and, and really kind of delivering on it. Because, you know, for someone just to say, oh, I really want um, a VIP event, <laughs> a red carpet event. Okay, great. We know that that involves a red carpet and post and rope for example but what else does it mean you know people's perception of things in their head can be very different and we really want to to get that down so that as i say we're all on the same page floor plans so um, for some events for example you might just be taking part in a bigger exhibition you want to know where your stand is for example where the runway is um, where the dressing rooms are um, or it might be if you're working on the whole event, you need to share that information with other people. So generally, the venue should be able to give you a floor plan. And then either your client or you and your client should be able to look through and mark out who's going to go where. And this can actually take some time <laughs> because um, a lot of people will look at initial floor plan and maybe not be happy. Um, so you have to think, who are the main stakeholders? Are you giving people a choice on these things? Um, or are you just kind of literally saying this is where everything is here's what time you're turning up um, look forward to seeing you in the day which is sometimes the easiest thing to do um, and then with mock-ups so we've got a couple of mock-ups here from a trade show um, that we worked on um, usually uh, you can get mock-ups done by a production company so using CAD designs um, or you can kind of use Excel or other documents if you're particularly arty and put something together. But again, it's just so that everyone knows what they're talking about. Everyone's on the same page. There's no confusion. There's no misconception. People understand what the color scheme is. Um, and it just helps everyone kind of come together um, and, and really unify to have a really impactful event. One of the things that I really like to focus on is the guest experience because again a lot of clients will kind of have the vision which is great um but they won't think about how the guest will really feel and that's important because that's a direct association with your brand is how people come out of the event feeling so i think it's really important to to have a really comfortable feeling from the minute someone arrives so that includes you know security is security firm but nice do you have a nice hostess on the door? Are you given a glass of champagne from the second you come in? Um, is the coat check in the right place or do you have to go all the way through to the back of the venue <laughs> in order to put your coat down to come back to grab a, a, a glass of champagne, for instance? Has food been thought of and different dietary needs been thought of, even just canapes for an evening event, for example? Um, are guests coming away with a goodie bag? Um, and if so, what's going in it? You know, is it kind of rubbish stuff that people are going to go, well, that was rubbish? <laughs> Or are they going to go, wow, I went to this event and they gave me a goodie bag and there was this performer and this happened. And, you know, essentially it's going to come down to what the client wants, you know, their, their needs, their expectation or your, if you're, you're the event um, organizer. But you really need to try and put yourself in the shoes of the guest and think about how they feel. Because, as I said, essentially your event, um, it's just a, it's just a. Um, another way of promoting yourself or your brand your brand your name you know so it's important to think about how people feel about it um, so how i begin <laughs> you can do this exercise if you like to but i i'm a very visual person so once i've kind of got all the logistic information together um i close my eyes so you can do this if you like <laughs> i close my eyes and i think about other events that I've been to and why they were so memorable. Uh, I think about the feeling of excitement. What would excite me? What would I like to see? How would I like to feel? What emotions would I like to have? Um, you know, what pictures would I like to take even and post on socials? Um, so I think about, yeah, like I said, past events that I've worked on or at or uh, that I've attended. Um, and I try and really get that feeling and I write it down, kind of draw sketches. Um, I think about events that have changed my life. So you can do the same thing again, you know, have you been to any events that made you perceive something or someone differently? You know, maybe you got to meet a designer um, and your perception of them was different. I can say I um, went to Buckingham Palace a couple of years ago for um, the Commonwealth Fashion Exchange and um, it was hosted by Kate Middleton 
um, and I got to meet a lot of people and see a lot of people. So Naomi Campbell was there, Stella McCartney, obviously Kate Middleton, um, Edward Enenfall, um, Adwara Bar, um, and Anna Winter, uh, the previous editor of Vogue. And actually, I thought I'd be terrified of her. She wasn't wearing her sunglasses. <laughs> she had a big smile and she was lovely. And, you know, that's 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 my experience of her and that's the only thing that I can say so you know sometimes your experience of people can completely change your perception so you know as a brand do you or your client um, have particular values that you want to convey and how can you put that into the event itself have you bought anything um, from attending an event and how did it make you feel so I don't know if anyone's attended um, the London Fashion Weekends for example you know they're much more geared towards customers and you know maybe you've been there and you've um had a bit of a makeover or consultation on styling and colors and that kind of thing and you realize that your color is pink <laughs> and you bought that pink lipstick and how did you feel or you you bought that pair of shoes how did you feel what was that elation like and how can you recreate that in your own event or your client's event and then obviously there's events that you go to and you just had a good time uh you know you forget about it yeah, it was a good night. It was a good event. It was an okay fashion show. <laughs> um, at the very worst, people would be coming out saying, oh, that was so disorganized. This went wrong. The people were rude. Obviously, you want to stay away from that as much as possible. <laughs> um, but ideally, you want people to come out buzzing. Because like I said, you know, everything in the end relates to sales <laughs> in some way, shape or form, even if it's just selling your, your visibility. Um, and people want to... To, to buy into something um, you know most people want to attend an event coming out of it saying what a great time they had no one wants to waste their time so again you know how can you make it really memorable so that people are buzzing about it and talking about your brand long after it's happened and that they want to book next year they want to come next year it's all over socials and half of the PR and marketing is done for you that's what we want so yeah so just thinking about how else you'd make it special um, you know, there's, there's lots of things out there, whether it's kind of guest appearances, whether it's, um, you know, kind of the, there was a big thing about photo booths and selfie booths and chocolate fountains and lots of other nice fluffy things that you can do um, or particular competitions. Um, you know, I took one of my uh, new event team to um, a trade show and they ended up winning uh, a hotel, five star hotel stay for two, which she took her mum to um, and a three course dinner. So I think she will remember that particular event regardless of everything else that happened or didn't happen. So, you know, what can you do to, to make it extra special? And some ways that we can pin that down. So there's something called the A6s. I don't know if anyone knows about them at all. Um, I've got them here. So it's the six dimensions of event planning or the A6s. And this can help you really pinpoint all of the emotions and put that into a logistical perspective. So we've got anticipation. So that's way before the event is, is com coming together and being um, kind of logistically put together you know you've you've got kind of the 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 outset I guess of it but and, and maybe you're kind of kind of close to putting everything together but in terms of the customer experience the guest experience starts way before so it's not just when they turn up on the day it's what does the invitation look like what does the marketing look like is there a lot of buzz and hype on social media so you want to ideally have this event that people are really looking forward to so again when you're looking at london fashion week for example you know i went um to february and you know there were three or four days not well, maybe one or two days um that i was just like do you know what i'm not really fussed about these particular designers or these particular experiences Mm, yeah I'm not going to bother going to them but there was a couple of days that I really really wanted to go to um, and that's because of brand perception partly um, and partly because of you know the format of it so one of the things that I really wanted to attend um, was the MTV breakfast so it was an MTV breakfast briefing they were doing in collaboration with River Island sourcing new designers and that was exciting um, and something a little bit different and Caroline Rush um, from London Fashion Week was there and lots of people were there, Iceberg were there. Um, so yeah, so I was really excited about that and buzzing about it and I took loads of pictures when I was there. Um, so yeah, so that was anticipation. Then you're thinking about arrival. So, you know, 
getting a rival right can be a little bit tricky because you know with fashion events in particular you might have some real vips so you want to make sure that your security for example is um very capable <laughs> um but you also want to make sure they're polite because you don't want uh, you know, one of your top VIPs coming or your designers coming and security is rude to them or sends them around to houses, which has happened to me a couple of times. You know, you really want to think about, you know, it's the first point of entry. So um, for me personally, there's a particular security firm that I use because they're all male models. <laughs> Um, but they also have their security, um, SIA. So, uh, yeah, so they look great. <laughs> They're really polite. They all wear suits and ties, um, but they also know how to handle things if anything gets out of hand. M quite unlikely for most fashion events, but obviously you do get some people who kind of um, act up a little bit. So arrival, that's important. And you don't want anyone to feel kind of disgruntled or annoyed, you know, from that um, experience outside of doors to coming into the venue because that kind of sets the scene for everything else so your guests have now come in you're thinking about atmosphere you know are you going to have some music beforehand is it going to be live or just background music um, you know what's the buzz like um, you know are you going to have designers there beforehand doing meet and greets or is it literally people are going to come in and just be seated straight away are you going to have people seating them or uh, is it literally free for all or is there just signage saying front row is for VIPs or, you know, how are you going to handle that? It all feeds into your logistics. Appetite. <laughs> so food and drink. As I said, you know, I am always one for including food and drink in events because it satisfies a very basic need, um, particularly depending on timing so you know if people are coming straight from the office they're really busy literally coming straight straight from the office to your event you know that's going to determine how long they're at your event for um, or whether they're complaining oh there's loads of champagne but there's nothing to eat <laughs> uh, as i said what are they going to do are they going to leave the venue to go and get something to eat then that risks them not coming back um, you know if it's a daytime show maybe not so much but you know then you need to think is the show around lunchtime um, are there food retailers nearby? Is food allowed into the venue if you're not providing it? Again, all of these things and, and communicating this with your guests to manage their expectations. Is it a free bar or a cash bar um, or card only? You need to put that in your anticipation, in your invites. Amusement, so entertainment, so that might just be the actual fashion show. Um, it could be um, a particular competition, maybe you know, as part of the entertainment there, um, is a, a model competition or best dressed competition that kind of thing can go on can go down really well depending on the type of um, guests that you have um, are there things that you can take pictures with particular props because everyone wants to take pictures in you know an exceptional venue or with models or you know with a particular designer and you know as I said it's all about how the guest feel, feels when they're coming out and how they're talking about you on socials and if they're buying into you afterwards and then finally we're thinking about appreciation so a lot of people will, will attend an event, leave an event, and the event's gone maybe for another year. But, you know, there's a real difference when people follow up. So, you know, thank you for coming to this event. Here's a picture of you with X, Y, Z. <laughs> you know, that can go a long way in people's memories. And, you know, it's these kind of things that sets you apart from other people. So six dimensions, the A6s, um, and this will really help you with your guest experience. Coordination and logistics. So um, I've put what are you coordinating because it's really going to depend. You might be coordinating the whole event um, or you might just be doing the production. So I've had both. I've literally um, worked on events where I'm just doing the whole event logistics, but I'm not getting involved in fashion show production at all. And other ones where other people, other teams are, are doing the whole event and I'm coming in to kind of produce or do model calling or backstage management. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. So you need to be really clear on that first and know everyone that's working in the team with you and set up a really um, transparent and quick line of communication. Everyone works differently. So, you know, some people prefer phone calls, some email some people like to collaborate on documents you know you have to think about how you're going to manage that coordination process 
suppliers so we talked about do they match you your client brand so maybe you like sushi <laughs> but um you know if you're doing africa fashion week you know maybe that's not the kind of food that your guests want to have so you know you need to think about things like that same with you know particular theming you know maybe you personally like really clean outlines um but actually you know what's going to be more entertaining and more um interactive with your brand is lots of big bold color um as i said is that going to just be in your show or is it going to be your whole theming is it going to be you know from the minute people walk in or just in a particular event space and as i said really thinking about the audience as well like not just your personal preferences you know i've again <laughs> worked with some clients that have very specific preferences but they're only thinking about themselves um one client love dark chocolate <laughs> and so in the goodie bags she just she wanted dark chocolate she wasn't thinking about anything else but you know the proportion of people that actually maybe like milk chocolate white chocolate sweets vegan chocolate you know you have to think about all of these things as well um does it match the theme so you know maybe um maybe you like or you want to go for cocktails but actually it's going to be better for you to go for champagne so it's kind of thinking away or your client thinking away from their own preferences and you helping them to consider what's going to be right for your particular brand company brand or the designers showcasing um or the audience attending um so you know sometimes all of that will will tie in sometimes it won't are they nice <laughs> or helpful so again when you're thinking about venues, you know, I've booked venues um, sometimes on just on the fact that they are nice, that they're helpful. Same with um, caterers and designers. Um, I'm talking about kind of styling, event styling and that type of thing. You know, a lot of people offer the same thing. So what stands them apart, even you as an events professional? Um, it's the fact that maybe you engage particularly well with people you're helpful you help people to solve problems um, and ideally you want to work with other people that are like-minded so you know 10 people can offer a photo booth maybe they can even all offer it at the same price but there'll probably be at least one or two people that you lean towards just because they're a lot easier to work with um, a lot more accommodating they're communicative um, flexible reliable you know and this is why event people tend to prefer working with their own people because they know that they're going to turn up <laughs> it's always a risk when you're doing an event for the first time or using a new supplier are they even going to turn up is it going to look like what it supposed to look like are they going to have everything that they need or are they going to constantly follow you around asking you for things um, and do they want to go the extra mile so personally i like to work with people who do um, again the commonwealth fashion council we had remy mata the drinks brand and one of the caterers that i work with and i left them to it they were great um, the caterers were able to build remy um, their own bespoke um, bar using crates and it looked great and the venue had chipped in with lighting and yeah it just looked amazing and the client was really happy and yeah it looked great and all the pictures so you know you don't want to be with someone who just literally kind of comes with something dumps it and goes <laughs> you know you, you want to work as a team um, to create something really special Issues. so um some things that we need to think about um to get the the best for the budget for example time of year is that going to affect when you do your event day of the week the number of days so a venue that might do or e even virtually you know something um for three days maybe they will decrease their price per day because it's block bookings um you know sometimes people don't even ask the question obviously you'll get people that say no <laughs> but some people won't ask the question and could be you know uh, making a saving or be able to put that budget elsewhere time of the day you know um and length of time the location um either promise to pr repeat business for example and referrals um and some venues and some suppliers will work on an in-kind partnership so you know it, it often works with media really well you know we're, we're doing this event um we can give you five vip seats at the front um in return for um advertising on your radio station for instance so lots of ways that you can be creative with it then we actually get on site <laughs> um so it, it's a really um it's a balance of teamwork and soft skills so team well it's not really balanced it's it's 
it's important to have both um, and this is where some people fall down you know they they're very good at the planning and logistics but when they got on site sometimes they really um, stress or sometimes they kind of bark orders and it's not helpful for anyone you know if you're that kind of person I encourage you to try and be as patient as warm as smiley as possible I've had to teach myself this over the years um, and soft skills really are important so um, here are the top five skill sets of an event manager according to the event manager blog um, people skills so yeah really important organization time management flexibility and passion these are all really important um, prior to the event um, but also on the day so you know sometimes you can um, get the venue to give me to give you an extra microphone that normally they would charge for just because you're able to give them that winning smile <laughs> um, or you know just your interaction with them that you know they want to do you a favor they want to help you out organize so you know having all your documentation with you um, everything that you might possibly need um, and knowing exactly what's happening managing time so so time is always a little bit of a difficult one because you know there are people that you can't control so you know especially when it comes to designers sometimes models but hopefully not <laughs> um but often designers you know will, will kind of come in or they have last minute requests or maybe they've forgotten hangers or something so these are all the kind of things that you need to think about beforehand and factor into your timings and leave buffers for everything being flexible as well you know maybe a designer has seen there's another designer before them and um, it clashes can you swap it around because if you can and it's not too much hassle that designer will probably be a client of yours for life for example and passion look, honestly you have to love this industry <laughs> uh, it's it's a very rewarding industry but you know you, it, it takes a lot of dedication um, you know I've had a lot of late nights early mornings you know um, working against the clock <laughs> um, weekends everything you know and ultimately everyone should want to work to get the project done uh, and that's what I mean about choosing your suppliers as well you don't want to work with a supplier that, that shuts off at 5 p.m on a Friday and your client um, or your venue needs to do something with you on Saturday and you can't make a decision until the following Monday that's a nightmare you know it's great if you can message them and just kind of say this is the the, the deal can you help with xyz um, and that's passion and if you find that network of suppliers and those clients and those people then don't let them go and I've just added in communication and values because as I said communication is key we all say it, it's key in everything <laughs> um, in every type of relationship but it's so important because you know people need to know where they stand if they know where they stand even if they can't solve anything but you're telling them you can you know often things don't have to be the drama that sometimes people think that they are um and also thinking about values as well you know my values are loyalty reliability so you know even if i've had a, a nightmare with the train for example none of my clients worry that i'm going to be there or not they all know me and have known me for a number of years and knows that i know that i will always be there and that's really important to me i decided that was you know a core value from day one so again logistical considerations um, the event starting at um, two o'clock but you need access from 10 a.m to build the runway for example you know these kind of things need to be factored in before you sign a contract sometimes they can make, be negotiated after and sometimes it's more beneficial to do it after but it's a consideration that you need to factor in the time it takes up to set up each supplier or activity so you know some suppliers it takes you know three or four hours to 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 set up backstage for example um, so what time you need access might not be the same time as what your suppliers need access to the venue for what time the door is opening um, and what's going to happen and you've got the event end agenda versus content agenda so the event you know doors open 6 p.m um, uh, with drinks and canapes till 6 30 um, then the runway then meet and greet with the designer then competition then um, doors close for example content agenda is within that so okay you've got 10 designers showcasing at this particular event and these are the timings of all of them um, this is the music that's playing for each of them <clears throat> this is the the turnaround time for everything the staging the music whatever so that's the content and again you need to think about both if you're managing both 
the event finishing time. So event finishes at 11, but the venue closes at 12, for example. Is that enough time to get all of your suppliers out? Is it enough time to get all of your guests out, particularly if there's networking? Normally people don't want to leave a venue straight away. They want to chat. Maybe they see their friends. Um, so you need to think about that as well. You know, is 12 a.m. the hard time or is it a soft time? And actually, you know, if people stay till kind of quarter to 12 and then you're shipping people out and then packing down, is the venue going to be okay with that? Um, and then pack down, you know, sometimes venues will be quite strict. You have to take everything on the night, which is not ideal. <laughs> um, and sometimes, you know, if they don't have an event the next day or they don't have an event till the afternoon, um, you can leave stuff overnight. But again, your suppliers need to be aware of that. Your clients need to be aware of that. The venue needs to be aware of that. Everyone needs to know where things are stored. So it's these kind of small things that people forget. You know, people think, oh, running an event is easy. It can be, but to do it well, to do it without stress, to do it with impact, it's really good to have structure in place. Teamwork makes the dream work, always does. So, you know, um, I've got a great team of people and, you know, they have better skills than me in particular areas and I let them get on with it. Um, and that's the best way, you know, no, no one can manage everything by themselves as much as they may think they want to. Um, <laughs> when you're on site, as I'm sure most people know, you know, people don't want to necessarily be hassled by parking arrangements, by what time the catering is coming out, by um, the AV isn't working, you know, that, that's what, um, you know, an event person, a professional is for. But within that, you have different people, you know, um, model callers backstage staff um front of house staff you know all of that so the main thing is that everyone again knows where they stand so having team briefings um, i normally have um slightly tweaked ones for the team for the client for the suppliers um for the venue as well often they want to know i have on-site checklists so for each of the room set up um, and then i can give that checklist to anyone in the team who can then just literally go through and make sure everything's in order personnel list so um definitely for music events and for some fashion events as well um people want to know who's coming in and out of the the building and then agendas so you know guests often like to know what's happening so i have seen this with fashion events they're expecting a certain thing um or certain timings and um it, it doesn't <laughs> uh it doesn't happen or it's not there and they don't know Kind of what's going on they don't know whether to stay at an event or not um, again this is communication and it's just making sure that everyone's really comfortable and um, knows what they're doing so key documents that i have contracts and agreements obviously that's really important statements of work invoice and payment terms whether that's between you and the client or um, the suppliers as well terms of business and cancellation policies which is obviously really important at the moment with everything that's been happening and you know some suppliers and venues are, are not dealing with this particularly well other suppliers are dealing with it very well and i think that's long term going to, to really make the difference between who people go with or don't go with after the pandemic supply booking forms so whether that's you um, working with a model agency or specific you know that's them um choosing to um, commit to something and not just calling on the day saying ah oh, something's happened i can't find my keys sorry i won't be turning up which is a nightmare for everyone and health and safety tools and templates so as i said basically i i section everything into four different sections and within that many other different tools and templates that i use that i've developed over the years but pre-event planning event coordination on-site delivery post event i really think as long as you kind of look at those four separate areas you're giving yourself a really good chance and finally post event analysis and i think this is really important as well because it's very easy for people just to um, do an event pat each other on the back go home that's it for another year but actually you can really get much more out of it if you um take the time to um have you know a few days even uh, a week to wrap everything up so who can we learn from generally it's good to get feedback from your clients and or stakeholders so that could be event sponsors as well did they have their expectations met were they happy with it did they have any feedback on things that could be done better getting feedback from your staff and team getting feedback from suppliers and contractors and also getting feedback from your guests as well. Um, that might come through you or it might come through um, your client, but it's important to get these different perspectives in order to grow and to get better. 
um, you know, we can all kind of leave things with our own perspective and our, our own vision of how things went, but really to have something, um, as I say, impactful is good to get different people's perspectives as well. So what we can learn, we can learn what we did right, what we did wrong, if we reached our objectives, the client's KPIs, um, and if not, what we can improve on and how, you know, next year we're going to do X, Y, Z, and we're going to stop this and we're going to put more money here. Um, and we're going to go for even more X, Y, Z, you know, it's important that we really address these things. You know, that's, as I said, how we grow, how we get better, how we make more impact. You know, we can learn from every event and every project that we do. Repeat business, the recipe to success. <laughs> so yeah, so um, fortunately, uh, I've been able to retain most of my clients over a long period of time, um, which is great because it saves from kind of constant um, marketing and sales and promotion. I can really focus on the actual projects. Um, and that's really what you want. And that's what your brand wants as well. Like I said, you know, you want people coming out of your event saying how amazing it was um, that they want to come back telling their friends and family that they, they shouldn't miss it next time. Um, so that's, that's, you know, that's why emotion, if nothing else, you want to really put emotion um, as well as the practical side into your events. So yeah, that's it, everyone. Um, you can follow me, email me, <laughs> get some advice. I've also got a free um, ebook. Um, it's a mini series. And the first one is about consultancy. So the first steps of kind of getting the client information. Um, and you can see more about the business on jadegreenproductions.com. But if anyone's uh, got any questions, I guess uh, maybe we can open the floor up. Okay. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I can see and hear you. So that was a really, really incredible talk. I was sitting here the whole time like, oh yes, okay, that's a really good point. Like, okay, I need to remember this. It's interesting for me because, so obviously I go to, you know, being in the creative industry, I go to loads of these events. So you mentioned uh, Africa Fashion Week. I was there last year. You mentioned London Fashion Week. I went for some shows. And so it's interesting kind of hearing from the other side, like what it actually takes to, to put this all together and all of these different things that you sort of have to juggle yeah. um, all at once. But then also, because I have uh, my own event, which I hosted in, so I've done it for the past two years in January uh, in Nigeria, which is a sort of like brunch, you know, meetup for like content creators in Lagos. And so it was funny hearing you mention some things like, oh, did I do that? Did I not do that? Like, <laughs> oh, did I remember to do that thing? Um, so honestly, there was, there was just so much insight in, in, you know, just a short talk. I'm sure you could go on and on and on about it. Yes, I could, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so thank you for that really incredible talk. So I'm going to take a, um, a few questions. We have time for maybe two or three. Yeah. But just before uh, we take the audience questions, I have a question of my own. Sure. So you said you were talking obviously about, um, you know, all the different things that you have to take into account as the organizer, and as the sort of, you know, mastermind of this whole experience. But at the same time, you're also dealing with the client, you're dealing with their expectations and their desires. So when you were talking about that, you kind of touched on it with your chocolate example. But what I wanted to know was, were there any times where, so maybe you had put something forward as something that you, you know, on, based on your expert experience, um, you know, I think we should do it this way or, or, you know, from convention, we need to do it kind of this way. But, you know, on the client perspective, it was like a huge conflict. They were like, no, you know, and it sort of led to this kind of issue where you're saying one thing as the expert, but they're saying another thing <laughs> as the client. Has there ever been any kind of passion? Yes, it, it does yeah. happen. <laughs> um, I had one this year about a DJ. <laughs> um, <Ooh>. um, <laughs> Um, just like as part of entertainment and my kind of argument was the DJ really suited the demographic and also they had a really good following and it would have really helped boost things but because they had a different perspective on their demographic that, and they wanted to play it safe they didn't want to go down that path and I see that a lot um, it tends to be more with um, corporates I have to say um, or people that have kind of established a reputation over a long period of time, which is fine. You know, a lot of people don't want to take a risk. They've done it like this for five years. They, they know it works. They want to stick to it. But events is about innovation and growth at the same time. And if you don't take risks, you're never going to stay ahead of the trend and it gets more and more competitive. So it's, it's a balancing act. And, you know, maybe there are compromises that can be made. And that same client <laughs> also, um, they 
I had promoted a particular type of activation. Um, it was actually to have something really um, kind of immersive guest experience for them. And first of all, they said no. Um, and then they said yes. <laughs> and then they said yes. And the, the marketing uh, branch said no, because it wasn't in brand, but they hadn't understood all of the information because it had gone through this chain of command. <laughs> Whereas if they just picked up the phone, we'd had that conversation, they would have got it. And in the end, they ended up scrapping the initial thing that they wanted and going with our suggestion. So, but it's compromised that like, at the end of the day, if a client wants something specific, I will always put my suggestions and recommendations. I'll put my case out there, but it's up to them. It's their budget. Um, if it, if you know if what they say doesn't work or could have worked better, I'll be honest about that after the event and say, look, next time we could do X Y Z. Maybe just kind of test it out, see how it is. If it doesn't work, then obviously lesson learned. But I think you have to have you have to build up that kind of respect with your client as well. Okay, so heading over to the chat now, we have a question from Kezia Kezia. Not sure. Kezia. Hello, <laughs> Kezia. Kezia Carter. Um, she has a question about charity work. I think there's a really good question, actually. So she wants to know, are you expected to work for less than your usual fee? So when you're doing uh, you know, a charity kind of project, and uh, do you feel under pressure to do so, if it's not a requirement? Mm. It's going to depend on the level of charity <laughs> in all honesty and how much budget that they have. You know, there's a lot of charities that will say we're a charity. We've got no money. Um, but some of them have internal events and marketing departments. So them, there's money there. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think honestly, you have to decide how much of your heart is in it. There's always an amount that I personally will do because I'm quite socially minded and there's, there's specific things that I'm really interested in. Like I, I love animals, for instance, <laughs> so that pulls on my heartstring and children. So I'll make compromises <laughs> for um, specific causes, but I think that's kind of like a personal thing and don't be fooled. You know, there's a, a, there's a lot of small and medium sized charities that, that don't have the money, but then are they really in a position to hold an event? Maybe they should be looking at a marketing tool um, or, you know, maybe they just need to get the sponsors in place because when there's a, a real lack of budget, it just squeezes everyone, not just, you know, sometimes in terms of time, because it takes longer to negotiate things. You can't just book the things that you want and they don't factor that in. You know, they, they'll say they want the event in three months. They don't have the budget to do it. And therefore everything takes longer and is a lot more stressful. So you kind of have to weigh up and, and get them to weigh up as it were set as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, any advice on how to handle a last minute crisis when it is a live event or show specifically? happens <laughs> um yeah i had yeah at a music event well two events it's um happened so one music one fashion one music event um we realized uh one of the artists hadn't turned up and he was on in like 15 minutes and <laughs> basically the problem was he uh the agent wanted everything to go through her and she hadn't communicated the right dates um she got confused on dates and he lived in southampton <laughs> So that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so literally, I mean, the thing is, you have to stay calm as, as a professional. You have to. Lots of people are going to panic. Your client might panic. They did panic a little bit. Um, the other artists might panic. So you have to be the person that stays calm. If you can't be that person, you need to designate that role to somebody else. At somewhere, there has to be that calm person who's the port of call that can troubleshoot. I mean, all we did is we asked the live band to play for a little bit longer and we switched around the other artists and they were a bit annoyed because they didn't have as much time to get ready but you know it wasn't wasn't the end of the world mm -hmm. um the, the audience probably didn't know any better to be honest because we didn't <laughs> you know we had an announcement of the lineup but they didn't know who was coming where and they were having a great time so a lot of the time as long as you're smooth for your team and you're smooth for the audience as long as people have a good time then they're not actually that bothered um with the fashion event <laughs> there was a power cut right before <laughs> The runway show, um, that was a little bit of a disaster. Um, but again, it's about communication. So, you know, it was out of our hands. What we did is we explained to the guests, we gave them free drinks, we asked them to go and network, um, and we sorted out the problem. And within about an hour, I mean, some of the guests obviously left, um, but within about an hour, um, it was sorted out, it was resolved. But again, this is where people skills come in, you know, making sure that you're going around to your guests. Um, and talking to them, socialising with them, 
introducing them to people, making sure they have drinks available. Um, and most of the time people will understand. So it's how you manage it as an individual, as well as just being able to troubleshoot something. Um, so I have a question from Buki. She wants to know, uh, so she says, event managing is frequently cited as one of the most stressful jobs in the world. Mm -hmm. um, seeing as you have many other things to talk about, do you find yourself outsourcing, so this brings back to what you were just talking about, mm -hmm. do you find yourself outsourcing the extra stress to a professional or how do you cope with it? And then also as an addendum, uh, what personality traits, skills and education do you think all event managers should have? Oh, <laughs> um, so I will, I mean, I, I have a team that I pull in for different things. You know, if, if, it's, if I'm just doing event consultancy or on the day event management, you know, that might just be me and one other person. Um, if, if we're doing the whole thing, then I'll have a team of people. But for example, there's one of my team who is great at sorting out um, the look of things. I'm not aesthetically, aesthetically that great. <laughs> you know, I know how I want things to look. And then I want someone else to do it. <laughs> so generally, um, you know, I, I have that, <laughs> I have that in-house. If I don't have it in-house, I will look to a professional to supply that because yeah, I don't need the additional stress. I want people to play to their strengths. I don't need to take control over everything. Um, when I started, obviously I was doing a lot. And as I was able to build up the, the level of client, I was able to build a really strong team. So, and they all know who their, their, um, their relevant departments are and people know who to go to for that so again that's communicating to everyone you know when i'm on site now i just do um i float i float around all the different departments i'm constantly making everyone is okay and running smoothly and if there's specific things i'll point them in the direction of a specific person unless i can troubleshoot right then and there um and yeah for example like i said event styling i know how i want things to look I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm great at styling myself or putting things together. So I will bring in someone else to do that or I'll get Erica, one of my, my team to kind of put things together. And that, that's great. That's great. That works. Like no man is an island at the end of the day. Um, and that way it means that I can kind of free myself up to deal with client requests, um, sponsors, stakeholders. So, you know, when I was doing um, the So Solid concert, we, we did the concert on the 13th of March um <laughs> just before lockdown <clears throat> and one of the photographers came up and actually quite a few people said afterwards which was really nice but one of the photographers was like i've never seen so someone so calm <laughs> how do you do it <laughs> uh and i i think it's putting things into perspective as well you know when i first started i kind of panicked the day before and i, I still have that kind of oh i hope everything goes okay and you know but at the end of the day, like I said, you know, customer service is the main thing. As long as your guests have a great time and your clients have a great time. And a lot of them don't care about some of, you know, some of the things. They don't mind if something's five minutes late, as long as you've got something else in place and you're communicating, you know. So it, those things are really important. Um, in terms of education, so there's a lot of event management courses out there. I actually le lecture um, part-time in events management at university now, um, and I'm building different courses. But there's two things to remember. Being organized and planning things um, are different skills to being a personal person on site. So some people are, are great at the logistics planning, and then when they get on site, they flap. I've seen that. I've seen other event managers literally be in the room like, I don't know what to do. This is going wrong. <laughs> Um, which is not helpful to anyone um, and then I've seen people who aren't particularly great at um, you know even using word powerpoint excel um, these are all things that creative industries don't generally tend to use uh, it's more of a corporate thing but I actually find that having that skill set is really beneficial to my clients in terms of organization and transparency um, and you know Either you can be good at one thing or the other, whatever you're not good at, fill that gap. <laughs> um, but there's nothing like getting on site, being on site to know if you can actually do the job. So I would say if you're new to the industry, volunteer as much as possible. I mean, I volunteered on things before I was getting paid for things um, in, in every role, you know, back of house, front of house, picking up pizza boxes, <laughs> um, you know, helping in box office just so I could get everyone's perspective. And I think that's really kind of set me up to, to understanding everyone's challenges and, and what tools I can give them to do their job successfully. Okay, so I think we have time for one final question before we close up. So I'm going to take a question from Wada, who wants to know, um, 
so thank you so much. So, uh, so smooth. And I loved how you presented to us. My question is, how do you protect yourself from bad clients legally and in general? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, you know what that means. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, there's practical things that you can do. Insurance is really important. So, you know, I've got public liability um, and public indemnity. Um, and then you can get separate event insurance. Um, so, you know, just if anything does go wrong, you're protected from a legal perspective. This is why I also say about um, contracts, statement of work, booking forms, they don't have to be super um, complicated. I don't get like really complicated documents uh, drawn up for, my, for most of my clients, you know, even just simple documentation saying, this is the expectation. If this goes wrong, this is what will happen. Again, it's just, it's communication and it's listing people's expectations and managing them. I have had a couple of bad clients. Um, sometimes you can kind of get warning signals. So if people are not communicating, if people are not responding, it's usually a warning sign. <laughs> um, if people are, you know, um, really disorganized, like on an ongoing basis, like everyone can have a bad day. But if, you know, if you're constantly trying to get information and the budget's always changing or they're not supplying the information that they said, then generally they're making your job harder and they're going to continue making your job harder. Um, there was one client that I had that, yeah, first of all, it seemed like everything was going to be fine. And then he became very difficult throughout the course of the project. And I couldn't wait for the, for the project to end. The event itself was, was a great success, but I just kind of was like, oh, that was a learning curve for me. I'm not going to work with that type of person again. So sometimes I think you just have to take it as an experience, learn from the experience, move on. If you can see the warning signals, then, you know, I personally would have a very honest conversation with the client and say, look, this is this is how I work. This is how I feel you're going to get the best out of me and your event. Can we agree to work in this way? And if not, then, yeah, maybe it's, it's better just to cut your losses. It's not worth the stress. <laughs> Wow. Well, so Jade, this has been such an incredible, incredible talk. Thank you once again for delivering and for sharing your knowledge with us. I would like to say very quickly, just before we officially wrap up, please remember everybody that Africa Fashion Week London, along with the Masterclass series, has online courses called Fashion Futures, which is in partnership with Henley's Business School in the UK and Parsons Design Schools in New York. And we also have scholarships available, so do make sure you go to the Africa Fashion Week London website for more information about that um and also for more information about the rest of the master classes that will be running out throughout uh will be running throughout the month uh jade do you have anything you'd like to say in closing socials contact information so yeah everything's just jade green productions so the website as i said jade green productions.com instagram facebook twitter jade green productions and like i said i have got um an ebook um, which is available free of charge. <laughs> so um, if anyone would like, then they can follow the socials and um, send a DM or they can sign up on the mailing list on the website. Amazing. Thank you so much once again for being here. Thank you to everybody watching. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I will see you all next time. Bye. Bye.